Our third panelist is, um, will join us soon, but we will already start with Vasil. And I'm sorry, it's very noisy. <laughs> is it? Ah. Okay. So I hope that people sitting here understand me at least. Is it fine? Do you understand me? Okay, great. Um, what we will discuss today uh, on this panel is somehow the, how artists and cultural activists look at the, uh, absorb and interpret the critique of the nation state and go beyond. So before on the panel, before we didn't have any images, this time we will have more images and talk about images and artworks. And um, now Miu is with us. Okay, so before we start the conversation, I ask you, kindly ask you to give a little bit a more in-depth uh, introduction to your work. A few minutes each, uh, I will do it. Uh, <laughs> courtesy, please, could you start me you about your work? Uh, where do you live and what were your projects in the past months and years? And then, Vasil, you give also a short introduction to yourself. Do we have only two microphones? Oh, we can share. We okay. can share. So, hello. Um, we're changing geography here. <laughs> and already it starts with a little bit of the confusion of my name. So it's you, me in the Chinese oh, way and sorry. me, you in the, uh, in the European way. I wouldn't feel um, necessarily bad about being called either way, but just, just so that we know what, who I am. Um, so yeah, I, I live and work in Cologne, where I teach at the Academy of Media Arts. Um, that's sort of a progressive, I guess, politically minded and very much media culture driven um, art school. Uh, but originally I am from Beijing and um, sort of um, I have a lifelong project which I translate also into research and curatorial project that looks at uh, the Silk Road or the Silk Roads uh, that uh, this network of, uh, of trade but also of cultural transfers that historically connected East Asia and Europe um, but also Africa. So I look both in terms of the art and culture that, has, uh, that, that, that was there, that had once been there historically, but also um, I try to distill a sort of meta-level understanding of the Silk Road as a decentralized network. So that kind of goes into the other area of my work, which is more media theory related. Um, and then using the, the old uh, Silk Road as a decentralized network, as an image to deconstruct what is today's um, networks that we see in transnational capitalism. So that's sort of very quickly what, my, what I'm working on, I guess, in the past couple of years. And um, we'll go into a more specific uh, research and project in the, in the following. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello. Um, first of all, I would like, my name is Vasil Cerepanin. Uh, I represent uh, Visual Culture Research Center, which operates in Kyiv. I'm also teaching at the Cultural Studies Department of the National University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy, so I'm based uh, and work uh, in Kyiv, Ukraine. And yeah, really, I would like to express my deep thankfulness to European Alternatives and to personally to Lorenzo Marsili, for having me here because uh, basically this event is made in collaboration with the, the uh, Trans Europa Festival together with the Kyiv International, Kyiv Biennial 2017, which is already on the go and we are organizing some joint events uh, here as well and also in Kyiv. So within our collaboration, um, it's apart from this debate, uh, there is also an exhibition curated by a colleague of mine from Visual Culture Research Center, Oksana Brychowetska, a feminist project called uh, Women's Texts. It's just in the venue next to this one. And uh, it's just opened several uh, days ago, and I suppose that today is the last day of, uh, of its conduct, so I would really advise you to visit the exhibition. So, yeah, I, uh, our Visual Culture Research Center we operate as a, 
um, public platform for artists, intellectuals, uh, meaning the academia in general, and uh, um, grassroots political initiatives. And that's the, the institution which overlaps uh, visual research, uh, contemporary art, uh, grassroots politics, and, uh, and political debates. So that's basically, also I think we will go in deeper in details when we will discuss uh, our projects and how they overlap. But I'm really happy that we have some sort of a real international here. That's my topic uh, also in, in terms of the biennial conduct, but also it's very nice that we, we are presenting in a very physical way. Okay, so we will have as an introduction, thank you very much to both of you. Um, we will have a look at some slideshow, and you don't see the images, so maybe you have to sit here. So, logistics, logistics, I'm sorry. So, just quickly to myself, I'm Katrin Hoog, and a curator at Kunsthaus in Zurich. I have been a curator in other institutions before, uh, among others, at Kunsthalle in Vienna. So, we were speaking, the f actually, there is one panelist missing, he was speaking before, two hours ago or something like that, Oliver Ressler, so he is uh, with us um, telepathically with this, and we, as a, to bring to our memory, the films are shown here in the exhibition uh, in the very uh, back of the, this hall, are two films uh, you can see from him. On the one side, there is uh, this animation film. He said before why he chose animation, which is to get back from this stigmatization image, image iconography of refugees. He wanted to look at new imagery uh, about the thematic of migration and also to get away from this stigmatization of a so-called crisis. And this is, this, uh, again, two stills from a second film from Oliver Ressler about Syrian uh, inhabitants in Turkey. And now I would like to make a quick tour d'horizon through imagery, art historical imagery, dealing with the notion of, uh, let's say, values, of uh, common values of our collective memory, and especially of um, democracy in Europe. So on your left side you see a work called, do you see it also, right? The, the, this is a work by Joseph Boyce who worked a lot on democracy and this work is called A Rose for Democracy and on the other side you see a very romantic notion of freedom. This work is called Freedom from Arnold Böcklin. The, the problematic of the problematic of politics as uh, uh, an attempt to balance power more than to look at dialogue has been thematized very early, or let's say, in the process of national, nation state building, and in this particular case in caricature and um, illustration, uh, which is in France a work called uh, Liquid. The, European equilibrium or balance of Honoré Daumier. This alludes to democratic values and the Human Rights Declaration in 1989 to the bicentenary of the French Revolution that is considered as the, the, the birth of a Human Rights Declaration 1789, but also the the extreme ambivalence that democratic democracy can also turn into a democ uh, um, how do you say it? Um, dictatorship of the people. Further comments on power in this case in the sec during the Second World War about the the monarch Kaiser Wilhelm II by Hans Richter. Other artistic movements, in this case, again, the Dadaists, which were actually, can be considered as the first European art movement, transnational art movement from Romania to the UK, uh, and was particularly 
based on migra migration, people on, uh, in course of migration, and uh, was founded in 1916. So it was a very important topic last year, 100 years Dada, and um, very much working with the destruction of language in terms of founding a new way of language as a tool of power in the culture uh, and in society in general. So here you have um, like close-ups from this image here, like over 50 people which can be considered or are considered as uh, European intellectuals, part of the European legacy of culture. You see Trotsky or, or Gail, um, Bertolt Brecht, Stefan Zweig, James Joyce, um, Amy Hennings, the, or Harry Graf Kessler, one of the very early, um, how to say, uh, oh, my English, excuse me. He, um, he wrote a lot of about the whole history in, in terms of history of Europe in his, um, he chronist, well, he was a chronist of European history in his uh, daily notes he did and are conserved now in Marbach. And with this image from an artist uh, on the left, on your left side, Bushra Khalili from Casablanca, and on the right side, Peter Fischli, David Weiss, two works from the uh, that were made in around 2010, and one is dealing with with the question: Why are we so open to migration of goods, or the the movement of goods on the one hand with the Euro palette? which made 10 times faster the processing of goods in the 60s, on the one hand, as part of globalization, and on the other hand, uh, consider migration as a, a problem, um, which is, in days of globalization, quite a paradox. Artists are also working about symbols like the strong symbols like the European flag. Here the, the, the stars are missing, but actually um, uh, Remco Torombosch worked about the iconography of the European flag at that time, 28, and he collected all these flags from the different embassies, the basic fabric, and noticed that they are all a little bit of a different blue. So. This flag has actually been designed in the 1950s from Paul Levy and um, also in the course of pan-European movement with uh, Richard Kordenhof and Galergi and others and was adopted in 1983 and, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, was adopted in 1955 by the European Council and then by the European Union uh, also adopted in 1983, so it's very, it was a very long process, but also pretty much also a, a old, oldly and um, accepted um, iconography of this uh, one symbol of Europe, European Union. An uh, interesting question also in this regard is how much can we confront new symbols and new imagery uh, like on, the, on your right side with Miranda Penel, a film about uh, military folklore, you could say, <laughs> on the one hand, um, and the so-called tattoos in Great Britain, and on the other hand, uh, symbols, like strong symbols, like parliaments and, and other architectural um, places of power. So, democracy, democracy, this uh, is addressed by Kaderatia and Fabrice Gigi, uh, and also mentioned it before, to what degree demo democracy can also, uh, we, we have observed it uh, a few times, is a, a sign of sover sovereignty on the one hand, but yeah, I mean like, in many other cases, I come from Switzerland, where direct democracy is very much celebrated. But I, um, I also have to say, um, there, are, there are also problems, because uh, depending on the, 
depending on the initiative that has been taken, the, the minorities can be quite affected by the decision of yes or no. So it's really also a question what, in any case, will come to, to um, vote or not. So, and now, um, this I, I go over. We, after this very brief uh, overview and of exemplary choices of um, collective imagery uh, through Europe, we will uh, start our discussion. And um, we will start with you. Uh, you have to tell me, hold on. So. Um, you choose to discuss about this map, and um, we didn't meet any maps before in my introduction. Okay. There would, could have been maps too. I mean, like maps is an imp a very important form of abstraction, of political abstraction, territorial abstraction, and also a way to, to discuss about places. So why did you choose this image? Actually, before I go into uh, this whole thematic about um, East Asia as a counter image and, and sort of as a historical predecessor in some ways to the European Union and to the fascist sort of element of the European Union, I'll, um, I'll quickly comment on something that Catherine, you just raised. Uh, Dadaism as a first pan-European artistic movement which happened just a bit over a hundred years ago. Now, um, the, the, the most famous, or at least art historically most relevant tactic of, the, of Dadaism is appropriation, right? So the, you know, when Duchamp puts the, the, the urine, urino in, as a piece of artwork and declares it as artwork, he appropriates something from another context and give it something, um, give it a new meaning. And that gesture in itself um, suffices as artistic. Now, um, what we see these days is appropriation happening in largely center-right uh, center to extreme-right uh, uh, political camps in terms of appropriating the, not just the rhetorics, but also the whole tactic, um, the whole discur discursive structure of what was considered the left or largely belonging to the leftist intellectual camp. So example, um, post-colonial theory, which leads to the sort of um, recognition of you know, non-European oppressed uh, peoples who um, use that discourse of post-colonialism and later post-coloniality and so forth, different variations of it, um, to fight their emancipation anti-oppression project, right? And now what we see is um, prominently in the US with the Trump uh, outright, uh, Trumpian upright uh, uh, movement is that they entirely appropriated this uh, operation of post-colonial thinking um, in claiming that they too have lost their identity, right? And their ident identity is this white, uh, blue color, uh, identity that has actually always been on the dominant side of history. So there's this very perverse operation. This is nothing new. I'm just saying this because I just came out of a work, two-day workshop um, organized back in Germany uh, called Perverse Decolonization, looking not in the sort of political correct way anymore because that uh, costs us too much, uh, it, not looking at, in this political correct way um, at race and gender and ra uh, 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 and yeah, national identities anymore, but uh, in looking at how the tactics of uh, decolonization itself as once a emancipatory uh, discourse, set of discourses, have been perverted and have been appropriated. Exactly, that ties back to this uh, Dadaist um, um, moment. Um, so, yeah, what I actually wanted to say is, I, I guess I started with a little, a little bit of a self-critique because I, I largely work in this cultural producing art academia sort of context where really it has become a standard to, to decolonize everything, right? 
And then what actually follows the decolonization, and there's a longer history to it. So it happened actually because of the new left, sort of, right, born of the 60s and 60s intellectual leftist movement, uh, recognizing that there is a global sort of uh, larger uh, picture, larger global picture of injustice and looking at the sort of uh, uh, non-West contexts started looking at uh, gender identities, racial identities, and all of these oppressions attached to this. These people were fighting on concrete grounds in the 60s and 70s, but in the pretty much in the by the mid uh, mid 80s, they were all assimilated into Western academia, top U.S. Uh, universities, and, and in the I guess in Europe you have uh, you know, Utrecht and these these sort of universities. So um, there is a sort of, this is my self-critique, right? Uh, functioning within the sort of cultural leftist um, circle, uh, this discourse have kind of lost its efficacy. Or it still sounds appealing and it's still, it's still, some people would argue actually, Vivid Chipper would say that actually the whole analysis is, is, is started out wrong uh, to begin with. Um, in any case, there is a sort of uh, vacuum of, um, of agency, or a vacuum of concrete actions um, that I think pretty much the leftist artist intellect intellectsia uh, share these days. And I'm, this is, I'm presenting myself critique in the hope that some of you brilliant <laughs> more politically engaged people can enlighten me on um, on concrete um, enterprises, uh, ways of intervening into this this discursive sort of muddiness um, that I never or we uh, never seem to get off get out of in the art and cultural producing front. So maybe that's the yeah to start with, and I'll go back to my yes. the original um, <laughs> proposal for um, bringing in. Um, kind of following this logic of perverse decolonization, actually, bringing in a different side of historical uh, events that may or may not help you look at the European project. Um, and this is the project. So basically, you're looking at a map of 1930s and 40s uh, Japanese empire. Um, I, yeah, I could, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you could recognize China is, the, is on the upper left corner, and uh, Japan had occupied by uh, 1932 already the northeastern part of China that's, I think, rendered in yellow. It's okay, no, I think the color is a bit off, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then uh, you see basically the entire Southeast Asia um, being part of the subjugated to Japan by or in the middle of the Second World War. And there's this lion that sort of um, covers a lot of um, yeah, the uh, Pacific, which um, so everything that I just, I just uh, uh, delineated uh, fall, fell into the Japanese uh, World War II territory, what they deemed as a, as a strategic circle for their national defense. Um, but it goes much more, no, no, it's okay. So um, the, the part of the story I wanna focus on is this Manchuria or, yeah, it's Manchuria in the northeastern part of China, which you see in the rather large geographical area. Um, that was a very particular construction of um, uh, of Japan. So Manchuria historic is all very tricky. Speaking about if that area historically belonged to any uh, 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 state, because that was we're talking about in East Asia um, different frontiers and empires, and there was not this notion of border and nation state, or not even state, um, until the early 20th century. So Manchuria historically was the homeland of, uh, of, of the Manchu nomads, although they went by different names. 
um, and it was the, it, was, it, it did belong to the last uh, non, the pre-modern dynasty, which is the Manchu Qing dynasty, which fell um, in 1911 uh, to the Repu Republic of China. But it was historically kept sort of um, as a buffer zone between the Qing, Manchu, Chinese dynasty and the Russian uh, Romanov uh, dynasty. And uh, in the late 19th century, that area had been populated by Chinese Korean peasants because there was uh, farming in, uh, in China, in Korea, and people had nowhere to go. And the Qing, as a dynasty, was crumbling at the time, so they didn't keep this border control anymore. Um, and um, the, the Russians built the Trans-Siberia Railway through the area after a treaty signed with the Qing, Manchu Qing dynasty. I think now we have which um, connected basically, as you know, the legendary Trans-Siberia Railway all the way to the port city of uh, Darien. Now, Japan ceded this uh, railway in 1905 in this critical war, uh, the Russo-Japanese War, uh, where Japan won, actually a very historical moment of a non-European power winning a ma major European power in world history, I guess in recent world history. Um, and what happened afterwards, the Japanese established something like, pretty much like the British East Indy um, Company, uh, along this sort of railway company and uh, started infiltrating political and economical uh, influence into this area. Now, China, I, in the meanwhile, had uh, fell or had fell to sort of different warlords and there was a moment of power uh, vacuum so that Japan in 1932, 31 actually, uh, staged a um, detonation and they used it as an excuse to m militarize and occupy this area. And in 1932, it followed that this uh, establishment of Manchukuo, which Japan had um, declared as a nation state, um, where they had installed the last Manchu uh, Qing Dynasty emperor, who you might know from this uh, Bertolucci film, The Last Emperor, right? Um, now, that's just a, the very basic historical background I needed to put out there because um, why, is, why was Manchukuo interesting? It, it ended in 1945 when, of course, Japan uh, 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 surrendered. Um, why, was it, why was it important? First, it was established as a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, and multi-religious state. Um, but that operation in itself uh, is not without flaws. Uh, the, Japan, the Japanese pretty much borrowing the sort of Soviet ethnic uh, attribution, as, ethnography um, uh, technique. They identified the different ethnicities in the region. They identified the Manchus, they identified the Mongols, um, and then of course there's the Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. Uh, they produced a lot of quite interesting propaganda films and stamps and and print materials where you see all these different peoples living together. Um, I, I don't. I don't. So it's okay. no, let's leave it on that. Um, and um, yeah, and the other aspect is that Japan actually uh, borrowed a very Confucian ideology to justify their rule or their indirect rule in this region, which is this idea that the emperor is the center of the universe and he acts on behalf of the heaven and he takes the mandate of heaven uh, to exercise a benign rule, right? Which is the, the historical sort of ideology of, of Chinese uh, emperors. Uh, but can I just comment on this? The, the, um heavenly given power is not, not specific to China. This has, in every monarchy, I guess, in the world, this happened, in, at least in, in 
for, for just to, to, to because you said it's very curious, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. it's pretty typical for monarchies. Yeah, so because, oh, yeah, yeah, we could speak of something like parallel world orders or different world orders ex existing at the same time. Um, but um, of course, the thing with China, what made, made the Chinese world order quite convincing, at least to the emperors themselves, uh, was that you had all this um, foreign envoys and you had this foreign. Uh, 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 emissaries coming to China and paying tribute every year, and it's a very ritualized, very um, symbolic ceremony where everybody has to call toll, meaning everybody had to kneel down to the Chinese emperor, and then they will exchange gifts. The, the gift exchange is also interesting because the you know when the Koreans came historically, they never the country was quite poor and didn't have anything spectacular to present, but they would present what they had and they would receive uh, things that's hundreds times more the value than what they've gifted to the emperor. So these are the sort of, speaking of a sort mm -hmm. of pre-modern foreign diplomacy, these are quite interesting sort of thought experiments to make just, just in terms of thinking. So maybe what kind of do we, he can also contribute to the discussion, maybe. Can I? Yeah, yeah, I'll okay. speed up. Okay. I'll speed up on this. Um, yeah, so we, we, we said that this is a very particular construction of a nation state but that uh, itself was based on this more European version of uh, uh, national, nationality attribution. We spoke about um, uh, this Confucian tradition, the mandate of heaven, uh, being a different version of, to justify political governance. And uh, the third aspect I definitely have to mention is that um, the, there was a finance uh, minister, Nobusuke Kishi, who was the finance minister or vice finance minister of Manchukuo, who served from 35 to 39 around the same time, or around this time. And later he served in the wartime Japanese World War II uh, cabinet also as a finance minister. Now Kishi had visited all Western European and Soviet Union and, and, and North America. Uh, before Manchukuo, and he learned the economic policies in different regions, and he combined in a very syncretic way uh, everything that he saw as most uh, effective. So he borrowed this idea of Taylorism from American factories. He borrowed uh, German technocracy, where engineers are involved in sort of decision makings who make key industrial sectors. Uh, uh, more efficient. He borrowed the Soviet five-year planning, and he combined all of this in this grand test ground of Manchu Manchukuo or Manchuria, um, which really effectively made the, the made, made, made Manchukuo into an industrial powerhouse, something to the to the um, level of Ruhrgebiet, uh, if you know, in Western Germany. Um, so how could he know about all these different theories and practices? Was he trained He's in the respective, or how did he, he appropriate on, yeah, all this? Oh, yeah, yeah, as well. He yeah. yeah, yeah, he went on a study trip. He went okay. on different study trips and, and okay. learned all about this. Um, and then there's this, um, and what was more to his economic policy was um, that is a very, he had a very authoritarian uh, uh, role in this. And with him, you could clearly see this form of state-guided capitalism, where the strong state tells key industrial um, cartels, uh, in this sector you have to invest, right? And, 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 and given what we were saying earlier with all these different syncretic economic uh, uh, ideas that he had borrowed from the West, uh, he basically made Manchuria the, the most, um, the fastest growing industrial area in the world in that time. And this largely provided for the entire Japanese Second World War operation, which was heavy on all fronts, uh, the entire East and Southeast Asia and later war, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, Nobusuke Kishi was the grandfather of Shinzo Abe, the current Japanese prime minister. And um, he was also not 
entirely uncoincidentally, a friend of uh, Park Chung-hee, who was the Korean military dictator in the 70s and who was assassinated, and whose daughter, Park kang hyo was this female Korean president who just got impeached, like, last year, I think. Um, so there's sort of a whole like econ political economic DNA of East Asia that goes back to this one person. But it's not just about that. Um, in the post-war um, era, Japan followed the same policy. Also, Kishi was the Japanese prime minister in uh, uh, s uh, starting 19, uh, uh, no, 1957, I think after shortly being imprisoned and, and being convicted as a class A war criminal. Um, he was uh, crucial in um, rebuilding the Japanese economy following basically the same model as, we, as he had tested out in Manchukuo in the 30s. And he was also uh, the key person in normalizing or with Pa chung they normalized the Japanese-Korean uh, relation. Um, and uh, Korea turned Japanese war reparation into Japanese foreign device, uh, direct investment. So, and after that, and we all know this sort of economic boom of, of Korea, and of South Korea, of, of Japan, and later of Singapore, of Southeast Asia, and all of these states uh, all went to um, Japan to actually learn now it's screensaver to learn the um, how they how they did it. So so in a way, sort of like German uh, Wirtschaftswunder, post-war rebuild. How did had how did it happen so rapidly? Um, it, actually, the reason why I mentioned this uh, is that you can sort of yeah. Forgot just one more thing. The, <laughs> during the war, sorry, during the war. As you saw with this sort of delineation of a vast East Asian um, um, Großraum sphere, uh, the Japanese had an idea called uh, Great East Asian Co-Prosperity Circle. And it's not actually not funded. I mean, they've learned everything about internationalism. They were, they were observing the sort of global solidarity the Bolshevik version of it or Kuomintang version of it, although they were, of course, militant rightists. They had sort of borrowed that discourse and they had this idea of creating a, a East Asian sort of um, community, if you like, which would be basically a precursor to European Union, but in a very, very bad sense, um, where all of these different cultures and once polities are now... Um, or now states, they would coexist in this sort of cultural sphere. And they also did a lot of propaganda, but also concrete sort of cultural exchange programs within this region. So that's why I brought up this very strange and I guess quite remote historical example of Manchukuo and this Japanese uh, 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 great East Asian co-prosperity circle. Uh, uh, to offer, I guess, a counter image to Europe. Um, and just lastly and briefly, the, I think we can go to the next image. Actually go to the next one, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, the first one, yeah. The, the most uh, uh, legitimate heir um, of this Japanese Great, e great East Asian Co-Prosperity Circle uh, is actually not Japan anymore um, because now it is China that is exercising this whole ideology at maximum. And of course there is no mention of this, it's just, it's just, a, it's just an economic model that uh, within the state itself you have a state-guided, cartel-driven uh, capitalism that functions uh, 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 very effectively and with, uh, in terms of international trade, it's, China has this, uh, as you see, this uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, where China um, pumps investments into, I think it's one third of the, of the world. 
in terms of area and uh, one fourth of uh, global uh, foreign investment flow um, is coming from this one initiative. So China is building pipelines uh, for energy, for resources, but also uh, building infrastructure, railroads and roads and airports and everything. Um, the, the, the economic po uh, policy in, in, in that or the sort of fun, uh, financial uh, structure of it is quite interesting. It's not IMF because it doesn't come with all this developmental aid sort of political uh, um, exchanges, but it's, uh, it's also not a commercial loan. So, and China has this sort of beautiful historical image of the Silk Road to justify this whole program. But of course, what's going on here is, uh, is something more like this great, great East Asia co-prosperity circle that was very much exercised under an imperialistic agenda than anything that we could say that is horizontal. So I guess that's my contribution. Um, Thank you for this very dense introduction. <laughs> um, I'm sure we learned, everybody of us learned a lot. Uh, many things I was not aware of, even though I have even family living in Beijing since 15 years, and I follow it also from this side, <laughs> since my sister lives there. <laughs> but. Um, what, uh, maybe we can speak about that later because uh, Vasil will. Uh, uh, we want to make a bridge to Vasil's uh, pretty uh, different context, but certainly also connected in a different area of the world. But uh, maybe we can speak about that later. Discuss it. How this, what you, these findings, uh, these rhetorics you are re uh, researching on, which I'm also not sure if they are really the domi dominant rhetorics, like Kishi, I've, I've much more heard about the rhetorics that uh, the op opening up of uh, Deng Xiaoping and uh, what his role was uh, in mystifying the economic power of China. Well, I, I thought it was much more related to this uh, 70s and you are, you are telling us that's much more, or explaining us for very clear reason why it's much older, actually pan-Asian and driven by Japan uh, connections. So I'm, very interested to hear more about how this goes into your artistic practice later on. <laughs> and, um, and curatorial and artistic practice. But uh, now, Vasil, uh, please tell us about your work. And, and images, yeah, yeah, I will switch the image. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, because even uh, also commenting to, uh, on, on what you uh, shown us from the very beginning, I think, and also this kind of uh, really global dimension of the uh, topicality that we are discussing. Uh, it really fits to, uh, to, the, uh, to the agenda of the Kyiv Biennial. Mm, and somehow uh, we are sharing the same, I would say, modus operandi with, uh, with basically this modernist line that you depicted, again, starting from Dada and, uh, and onwards, because this kind of... Um, uh, overlapping of uh, artistic and political fields and readiness to, to propose, to impose some utopian dimension on both fields. That's basically somehow what uh, we are proposing as well, uh, living in a kind of a counter-revolutionary status quo. And uh, I think it, like it, both, of course I'm speaking uh, from the other side of the European wall, being from Ukraine, but I think that's really uh, what our context uh, shares a lot with the EU one, is that uh, really very negative and uh, um, decaying trends. And uh, from this perspective, I would say that uh, somehow when, uh, when the trends are consistently negative, there is no other way out than to be a radical, yeah? to propose something really radical for, for this kind of context. That's why it's really overlapped uh, so perfect way, perfectly with, uh, with the Trans-Europa Festival and uh, European Alternatives Agenda, because in, in our case we are also um, being in the country after the revolution that the warfare, we propose in some uh, internationalist uh, agenda and also imposing that on a Ukrainian context as well as on a European one. 
Um, and I would probably mention here, uh, just uh, emphasize several important aspects also somehow which deal a lot with what you already said. Uh, because uh, even in, in, in regard to the, uh, to the description or the concept of, of this debate um, and the, the current day that how it's framed or shaped in a way that uh, we are posing a question about post-national some uh, status quo which is supposed to arrive. I think uh, that it's also we have to be uh, pretty careful about this idea because we have too much posts uh, recently, yeah, probably too much of them. And uh, we, ha we have to really take into account that every post, uh, of course, me, uh, say in post nation, uh, it's also, yeah, we have to be aware that... Uh, so you mean post in the sense that there's still not the, the new... That something the new is coming afterwards, yeah, what is after the nation. Which is not yet mm, defined, so what, to say. It's not yet defined, yeah, but uh, you see, the, the, uh, it's also coming from the country which is... Uh, uh, partly occupied, I think it's also uh, to keep it real yeah, in, in terms of real politic. We also have to understand that uh, it's pretty to saying like na no nations and no borders, it's also a very comfortable position to say. Yeah. It's, you, you can say that when everything else is pretty protected and secured. And if it's not, you are, say, you are starting to think differently. Yeah. But also, I mean that every post as an idea always evokes some pre, yeah? its own pre. So that's basically what we observe today, the fusion or the combination of uh, post-modern, post-political, post-liberal, post-whatever cynicism with a pre-modern, pre-political, pre-liberal uh, barbarism. That is why we are so easily uh, going on decay and going down towards uh, some um, barbaric discrimination, right, nowadays, and openly racist ones. Uh, so that's why I think it's, uh, in, instead of that, yeah, uh, instead of praising uh, uh, what can be beyond or uh, uh, below the nation or above the nation, this kind of constellation can be also, looks pretty tricky and uh, suspicious today, because that's basically this, the, uh, the constellation that we, are, we find ourselves in, the, the globalized, globalized perspective together with the identitarian ideology. Yeah? They, they fit too, very well together. And I think that what is really repressed is something in between. I don't say that it's a nation state, right? But uh, mm, that's why I think, uh, uh, like also if we recall this, uh, the, the, the current situation in Spain and with uh, Catalonia, uh, this kind of tendency back to tribe, this new tribalism, is uh, somehow is indicating that we are not overcoming the nation state, but it's quite the opposite, we are going back to the nation state. Yeah. And it's not by occasion that so much force, even political force and uh, military force, was used against the, the protesters because uh, it's always a symptom that, uh, that we, we are not uh, just, uh, we can forget the state in terms of welfare state, but uh, in terms of its core, its skeleton, which is uh, violent, state repressive apparatus, and uh, the emergence of new. Uh, authoritarian leaders, they're already on the stage. Yeah? And that is really very, uh, mm, uh, very dangerous, that we are somehow only pretending to forget about the nation state, but we are basically just forgetting the welfare part of it. Yeah? And the state repressive apparatus still remains. But, um, I try to understand the welfare state is, at least this aspect of the state is a very positive aspect, right? The welfare. Or yeah, 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 do, uh, yeah. We are speaking about the same thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is actually the part of the state that is massively deconstructed all over the... Yeah, okay, because I just mean uh, yeah, shortly okay. that uh, this kind of uh, post-nation state idea can be also really very reactionary and conservative yeah, mm -hmm. inside. That's why I think it's also very important to propose some internationalist agenda. Because internationalism on the contrary to the so-called post-whatever um, agenda, uh, means that uh, you are not just uh, attacking the na nation state as such, but you are proposing some framework or umbrella outline 
in which nation states uh, can exist, but they are actually, they don't matter so much. Yeah, I'm of course also referring here to this famous, uh, uh, famous um, uh, principle formulated by, uh, by of course, St. Paul, uh, neither a Greek nor a Jew. Yeah. So, meaning that, uh, of course, uh, Greeks and uh, Jews exist, but if you are a Christian, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that, that's also the task to be, to be invented yeah, or to be achieved. Uh, how to find a, a really uh, a formula for this new internationalist yeah, space where everybody can be inscribed somehow in. And on the other hand, I think this internationalist agenda, and I, I think we, we share a lot with the European alternatives in this point, uh, is, uh, is also very uh, urgent and challenging for the current political status quo. Because that's probably the only... And you were also referring to, to this perversion of the leftist heritage in the, uh, in the newly emerged uh, far-right edition nowadays, right? That's also very important because uh, internationalist idea, that's probably the only one from the uh, leftist so-called agenda that cannot be swallowed by the far-right. Yeah, and uh, internationalist idea, because they, this kind of universalism, this communist dimension, they really hate so much. So any kind of attempts to build a sort of a fascist international didn't even reach the stage of realization because they, they just cannot, so they can, they can swallow even socialist agenda and not by occasion, yeah, they were called uh, national socialist as well. And the, another process that we observe today is the proletarization of the far-right electorate. It's also a very symptomatic yeah, aspect. Okay, um, okay I, I will intervene. These are very, very great um, statements. Uh, we haven't yet spoken about the role of mass media in all these processes, which um, the rhetorics, the simplifying rhetorics of, uh, let's say, populistic po uh, agenda is would be the subject matter of another uh, discussion, I think. But this, uh, I just want to a little bit take defense of the provision of left, uh, let's say, left uh, good uh, thinking, which is not only the fault of these intellectuals. That's what I wanted to say. It's, there are many other causes than yeah. themselves. <laughs> uh, I mean, like uh, Tony you know, the third way and Tony Blair's agenda, of course, has also something to do with the end of the, the, the dualist world order. So we didn't speak about these things, which, of course, changed a lot in the, in the yeah, in, I mean, like the post-1989, now one qu quarter of a, a century. Yeah, it hasn't. It hasn't, yeah. You are right. Because we are a little bit, uh, it's so interesting our discussion, but actually we are already at the end of our uh, panel. I would uh, wanted to ask you to, uh, both of you, um, in a few minutes, say how you, in your artistic and um, uh, as a mediator of culture or curator, how do you, uh, maybe with one or two examples, or one example, explain how you materialize and condense the, f the rather theoretical things we said uh, now in your well, work? For me, I wasn't theoretical at all, right? Uh, Sorry. The, so, okay, no, no, you're right. Okay. The I, I was, okay. But, uh, <laughs> it was a provocation, actually. I wanted yeah, to provoke I hope you. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think that I even with the, uh, the uh, topic that we are discussing, this internationalism as, a, as a also a problem uh, for, uh, to, to be posed within the biennial framework, but also in terms of interinstitutional collaboration that we have also for several years with the European alternatives and other institutions. Uh, for us, it also, it's now, uh, yeah, it's tested in the cultural field because we are not operating in the political field as such. Yeah? We are rather conducting politics by artistic and intellectual means, by art and knowledge, right? But I think that uh, what we really can learn from the artistic field uh, is uh, very important uh, for the uh, future of politics. Because uh, in, in this case, I'm also referring to um, the recent experience of different uprisings throughout the globe. 
starting from the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Arab Spring, and to Ukrainian Maidan. What we basically saw during that uh, time, just recently, it was, uh, I, I would call it like a process of the search for new political subjectivity, yeah? which can be different from the existing ones, yeah? be it like a trade union or a party or an NGO. And uh, this new political collectivity found uh, or gained its form in the way of uh, occupation the central squares, uh, agoras. So the square movements occupation. Yeah. So, uh, but what we saw afterwards, also locally in Ukraine, but internationally, uh, uh, is that uh, these square occupations really uh, are really very fast, but they are finishing also very fast. That movements is not, are not enough. Uh, also in culture uh, and also in, in politics, that you have something in order to sustain your, yourself, in order to transmit your agenda and to continue your work in the future, you have to have something more solid. That is solidarity somehow also derives from. Uh, that's why we need institutions. Yeah. And that's why I think our cultural experience is so much important. That its mo movements are good for the start, yeah? but it's not the main course. Institution is something which, is, uh, which can constitute, which can establish when, when the things are put in proper place. I mean, I mean, I'm using the word institution as in good old days they were, they were using the, uh, the word uh, party, right? So th th there is a really very basic need today uh, in order to transmit our political agenda for the future and thinking about really internationalist uh, European space uh, to have something solid as new, newly emerged uh, institutions, collectives, which can operate on an international basis, and that's the only recipe how to conduct uh, real transnational politics in spite of the new walls and the new frontiers and uh, um, borders at the edge of globalization. I have a, maybe we can continue this discussion in Kiev because that will be also <laughs> dedicated to internationalism. But just, um, I, but if you look at the the history of internationalism, there were really only two moments, right? There's the sort of Bolshevik. Uh, uh, anti-imperial uh, uh, sort of front in the, in the 20s, which then got already s sabotaged by Stalin in the 30s. And then there's the third worldism aspect of it in the sort of Pantone conference and everything. Anarchism, yeah. Sorry, you have to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, very, very, very great. Uh, um, Sorry. Uh, uh, also, uh, yeah, important note uh, of the anarchist, uh, um, Movements, I guess, Swiss Jura mountains and everything. Um, also in Spain. Um, the, the, um, I guess my question is because I mean, we cannot really continue this anymore. But with these forms of internationalism, uh, you had a concrete enemy: imperialism, in the pre-war and the post-war uh, version. Now, what happens when you don't have that anymore? What kind of internationalism can you construct will be the question. I mean, I guess, I think, thinking with the European alternatives and this festival and very much in this translocal yeah. spirit, maybe there will be some answers, but I'm, I still have to uh, learn more and engage more with it. But this, I just wanted to quickly respond yeah. to you on that. Um, yeah, back to the question on my own practice. I, I mean, I, I just already said that I'm in a sort of self-critical moment <laughs> of looking at this whole leftist uh, cultural and art institution sort of practice. Um, I do, I mean, I, I hope I can at least bring in this, this aspect of criticality, not in the sense of post-structuralism, because post-structuralism is really, um, structurally embedded uh, in a way that uh, that conditions its own uh, wrongdoing or its own being appropriated by other forms of political um, um, uh, agencies, the sort of leftist in intellectual discourse being appropriated by the alt-right, for example. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll 
uh, within my own teaching, that's what I do very concretely in Europe, in Germany, I try to bring in this sort of double fold and this perversion move, the perverse movements of such thinkings. Um, whereas when I have more of a better institutional setup, a more um, a network of um, institutions and personnel and, 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 and above all actually audiences that can respond with me, uh, I, I take on curatorial uh, uh, works in primarily in East Asia, China, Korea, Japan, where uh, I guess I'm trying to construct this more transnational dialogue on the history uh, of East Asia, which really um, the, the working through of the, the, the imperialism in East Asia has not been quite done. Um, so yeah, in this sense, I've been curating, commissioning, producing, but also working as dramaturg on various uh, art and theater projects, but we don't have to talk about the details. We will do that next time. I'm sure it will be soon. Um, our time is uh, over, I think, so there's also no time for questions. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, we are around and uh, the colleagues are around and thank you very much for this very interesting, very dense um, hour or 90 minutes even. We uh, spoke about different uh, transnational post sorry for saying post, but post-national concept at different places in the world. So and now I hand over the microphone. Thank you very much.